Okay, so um, next what I want to talk about briefly uh, in this same context is uh, we've been treating it without a magnetic field. What happens if you put in a magnetic field? Well, we know that any time we put in the magnetic field, life gets more complicated because along the field lines, magnetic field lines, things are free-flowing as if I didn't have a magnetic field. Uh, but perpendicular to the field lines, we have gyro motion, you know, E cross B drifts, B cross grad B drifts, and so forth. So we'll consider, however, only a case with uniform magnetic field for a moment. It gets rather complicated to do more than that. Now, if we do that, parallel to the magnetic field is actually the same diffusion as before. Just what we've been talking about, no difference whatsoever. But perpendicular to B, we have gyro motion, etc. And so this will be just basically, let's call it different. <laughs> now, I won't go through this. I just want to sketch sort of what happens and tell you the generic aspects uh, of this particular uh, problem. Um, the basic idea is that um, we... Um, we have to introduce a certain parameter, but so let me just uh, sketch. So what I'll say is that if you just look in page 171 of Chen, uh, he goes through all of this, and I'll just quote his results. Namely, you find that the perpendicular mobility coefficient is the mobility coefficient which we derived before, namely 1 plus omega c squared uh, tau squared. Okay. Um, and, and, oh, I'm sorry, and I also need that the perpendicular diffusion coefficient is the diffusion coefficient times 1 plus omega c squared tau squared. Now, omega c is our standard um, gyro frequency or, you know, gyro motion frequency. And what's tau? Well, tau is just our 1 over collision frequency. So this parameter omega c tau represents omega c over tau or it's basically the number of gyro periods per collision. Actually, it's a radian number of gyro periods, but we won't worry about that. Number of gyro periods per collision. So you can, uh, well, and, and, and if you uh, then use those, you find that the perpendicular flow velocity is then the perpendicular mobility times the electric field minus the perpendicular diffusion, grad n over n. But then you also have the E cross B drift, which is not, quite, not in quite the same direction, and the uh, diamagnetic drift, and that also, it turns out, gets divided by 1 plus omega C squared over tau squared. So you can see that in some sense the critical parameter having to do with the diffusion is in, or in, a, in a magnetic field case is this parameter omega c tau. So what I want to do next is to talk about some particular limits. So uh, let's talk about uh, omega c tau limits. If we have omega c tau much less than 1, and what that means is a very few gyro periods per collision, then, uh, you know, I, I, have, I go just I'm on my gyro motion, I go just a little bit of a distance, and then I have a collision, then you wouldn't think the magnetic field would matter very much because I don't get through the whole orbit. And indeed, you find then, of course, that omega 1 plus omega c squared tau squared goes to unity, okay? And therefore, our d perp and mu perp go to their values without the magnetic field. And it's sort of like I didn't even have the magnetic field. So this is as if uh, no b field at all. So uh, that being the case, um, the next thing then we would, so th th this is sort of, you know, in the limit that, that the magnetic field is that weak. Remember, omega c was proportional to b, 
So in the limit that uh, the magnetic field is this weak, it's as if I didn't have much of a magnetic field at all. What about the opposite limit? Omega C tau much greater than 1. Well, then all these factors which I was talking about, mu was mu perp was mu over 1 plus omega C tau squared, that becomes very important, right? And it's, you know, so basically what we would say is the magnetic field uh, has a strong effect And in particular, this is what we often refer to as a magnetized plasma. I mean, you know, I could put on any magnetic field and still have an omega tau small, omega c tau small, but, you know, uh, it doesn't have much effect. So the effect, really having a significant magnetic field, comes in when the magnetic field is strong enough to have omega c tau greater than 1. It turns out this is easy to satisfy for ions, or for electrons, sorry. Uh, and but harder for ions, just because of the mass ratios and so forth. I won't go through that. Uh, but it's still almost always the case. So we quite often have so-called magnetized plasmas. Now, let's take then the limit. What diffusion coefficient do we get? from this d over 1 plus omega c tau squared when omega c tau squared is large, okay? So what is that d perp then? Well, d perp is equal to, again, d over 1 plus omega c tau squared tau squared. And this is then approximately equal to in the limit omega c tau much greater than 1. Now the d, we'll just go back, was t over m and then 1 over nu. And then the omega c tau squared, we just neglect the 1, so we get omega c squared tau squared. But let's remember that nu was 1 over tau, and so one of these factors goes away. And, you know, this 1 over tau squared effectively gives me, this gives me nu squared over nu, which is nu. So what I find is that the diffusion coefficient perp is nu, uh, sorry, times t over m omega c squared. Now t over m, okay, is equal to what? Well, I'm going to ignore my factors of 2 here again, and that's just the thermal velocity squared. And the thermal velocity divided by the cyclotron frequency is the gyro radius, okay? So this becomes nu rho squared. Does that make physical sense? Sure, it says particles go around the magnetic field. You know, they gyrate around the magnetic field, and they have a collision ever so often, and they move by a distance rho. So this is, again one of these, you know, delta x squared over delta t type arguments, where here the delta x perp is the gyro radius, and again, the 1 over delta t is the collision frequency. So sure, it makes sense. Now, in a plasma, magnetized plasma, what's the ratio of the perpendicular to parallel diffusion? So ratio of perpendicular to parallel diffusion in a magnetized plasma. Well, d perp over d parallel. d perp is the collision frequency times the gyro radius squared d parallel is the collision frequency times the mean free path squared. So that's pretty easy. Uh, take out the two values of nu, and all you find is that it's the gyro radius divided by the mean free path squared. And usually, you know, we have a sort of long collisional mean free path, meters typically, and gyro radii in laboratory type plasmas, and gyro radii like tenths of a centimeter, centimeter, something like that. So this is usually, in a magnetized plasma, 
uh, by the way, you could also write this, maybe I should do that, rho we could write as V thermal over omega sub C, and lambda we could write as V thermal over nu squared, and so if you, you know, take out the two V thermals, this in fact becomes, uh, oh, and nu is 1 over tau, so this becomes 1 over omega squared tau squared, much less than 1. Remember, because we have a magnetized plasma, so we have many gyro periods per collision time, and that was actually our assumption, so we're just kind of going in circles here a bit. Okay, so the moral to this story then is that uh, parallel diffusion in a plasma is much, much faster than perpendicular in a magnetized plasma, if, if I really have a magnetized plasma. Now, the next question I want to ask is a little bit different one. Um, we've got all this diffusion now. Uh, let's suppose that we um, have a slab or a cylinder of plasma. How long will the plasma stick around if I have this diffusion going on? That's the fundamental question. Maybe I'll have to have the ambipolar diffusion coefficient. Oh, by the way, on the perpendicular, I have to go through all this same argument about you know, whether it's ambipolar or not and that sort of stuff, and get the net ambipolar particle diffusion rate. But we won't go through all the details of that, it turns out. But now I want to ask the question, well, just stick a hunk of plasma in a, in a cylinder. Maybe it's a magnetized plasma, maybe not. We won't worry about that just yet. Uh, or a slab. And what I want to know is how long is it going to stick around? How fast will it decay? That sort of thing. So... Uh, we call that the, the uh, confinement time. So what I want to know is net particle confinement time. And what I have in mind, okay, is a kind of slab of plasma. So I'm going to have some density, and i got some walls here, maybe, and a distance. I'm going to have it spatial coordinate x, and I've got walls at a and minus a, and I have some density profile, you know, like this. And uh, so what I'd like to know is if I stuck that plasma in there, and I've got a particle flux fixed diffusion law diffusion, um, how long is it going to stick around? You know, how long is this going to decay by the, the particle flux uh, due to the inhomogeneity? So how do I do that? Well, what I do is I start off with the density conservation equation, dn dt plus del dot gamma is equal to zero. And I've got a, let's call this a plasma slab. Um, and uh, I've got a particle flux, which is minus d grad n. Okay. And uh, so what is del dot gamma in slab geometry? Well, it's just x, y, z geometry, you know, and I only got an inhomogeneity in the x direction here because I've got, I'm assuming by a plasma slab, it's infinite and homogeneous in the other two dimensions. So del dot gamma just becomes minus d, d squared, well, partial of n squared with respect to x squared. So my equation... Okay, sticking then this del dot gamma back up into here and sticking it over on the other side is I get an equation dn dt is equal to d d squared n by dt squared, dx squared, sorry. Okay, and so that is a partial differential equation in two variables, time and space, and it is, of course, the diffusion, standard diffusion equation. What that says is I put away, put in some density profile and it will diffuse away. I would like to know how fast it will diffuse away. And how do you solve such an equation? Well, you do it by a separation of variables technique, right? So we'll do that. We'll sketch how this goes, I should say. Separation of variables. Um, 
what we do is we propose that the density, which is a function of x and t, okay, it's going to, you know, this uh, density profile is presumably going to, you know, diffuse away, and so it's function it's, it's as as time goes on, and so the idea is that uh, by separation of variables, what we do, we say n of x and t is equal to some spatial function, which I'll call capital X of little x, and then some temporal function, t of t. And as long as d is a constant, uh, that will, we, we, can, um, uh, uh, we can separate variables here. So in particular, we make this onsatz, and then we show that it's OK. So let's uh, do that. Um, so substituting that in. Um, we end up with, uh, on the left-hand side, we have capital X uh, dt dt is equal to dt d squared x by dx squared. Or these partials are now really the functions they're taking derivatives of are only the function that's having the derivative taken. And so I manipulate, of course, and I get 1 over t dt dt uh, is equal to 1, or d over x, uh, d, and d, ah, total derivatives now, d squared x d, dx squared. Now, the function on the left is, uh, is only a function of a time. And the function on the right is only a function of space. And therefore, they can be equal only if they're both equal to some separation constant. And the separation constant I will call is, uh, is, the, is a decay time. Okay? Notice this 1 over t dt dt. I'd like to have that as a 1 over tau uh, type of thing. And it, turns, and, and it turns out, of course, we're going to get eigenmode solutions out of this, and so I'll, I'll have maybe a bunch of such eigenmode solutions. So taking account of that in this, this part of the equation for a moment, uh, well, this part, well, yeah. Anyway, uh, will give us then an equation that we have d squared cap x by dx squared plus then uh, 1 over d tau sub n cap x of x is equal to 0. And for our particular plasma slab, then, um, what are the sort of natural solutions? Well, our boundary conditions for the solutions will be first that the density at plus or minus a goes to 0, because we want to say that at the walls it vanishes. And also that, that the density, we want a symmetry about the center. Although we don't really need that, but anyway, I, I will choose to have that. So we have dn dx uh, is equal to 0 at x equals 0. I could have some other temporal stuff, but I'm presuming a symmetry. So what this gives you rather quickly then is that your x, you can have a whole bunch of eigenmode solutions, and your x sub n's uh, then turn out to be just uh, some coefficient, which I'm going to call n sub n, uh, times then cosine of uh, pi x over 2a. So that'll make it vanish. You know, this will vanish at, the, at x equals a. Okay, because cosine pi over 2 is 0. And then for good measure, I put in the 2n plus 1 to get all of the other values there. Now, if I look back up here, what I would like to know is to get tau sub n, the separation constant for this calculation, I would like to know what it is that uh, I have or I'm sorry, I'd like to know d squared x dx squared, 1 over x d squared x dx squared. And so if you just calculate that, 1 over cap x d squared x, so this will be 1 over tau sub n is equal to 1 over x sub n x sub n 
uh, dx squared, and I guess I've got to have a t, a d as well, and maybe a minus sign. And so you stick all that in, and second derivative of the cosine will be just the argument squared, and a minus sign will take care of that. And then the cosine, the cosine upstairs and downstairs will cancel. So you just get minus d, and then pi over 2a, all times 2n plus 1, squared, squared. So that's the separation constant, and there are a whole bunch of those. So now if you uh, construct the overall solution, uh, go back, what you find is that n of x and t is equal to the sum of all these harmonic contents, decomposition of the original um, perturbation, uh, n sub n, the Fourier coefficients, uh, our x sub n's, which turn out to be cosine of uh, pi x over 2a uh, times 2n plus 1. And then I also, that's, so that's the spatial function. And then I have to multiply by the temporal function. But what is the solution of 1 over t dt dt is minus 1 over tau n? Well, that's just e to the minus t over tau n. So, you know, this is e to the minus t over tau n. And tau n, I guess I can solve from this business here. Namely, tau sub n is equal to, uh, sorry, that should have been a plus. Um, I'd like to write it in a little different form, so I'll write it as the form a squared over d. So you see, I got an a squared and a d there. But then I have a numerical coefficient, which is pi over 2 squared times 2n plus 1 squared. Now, let's go back to what I was doing here. So I start off with some irregular density distribution, assumed symmetric here for simplicity, and then I let it decay. After a little bit of time, not too long, you know, what happens? Well, what happens is that the time, you know, all the, there's a bunch of whole short time scales here for these high, high end components, which are, you know, sinusoidal bunch of wiggles type things. On the other hand, finally, as, as the time goes to infinity, the decay is governed by the slowest one, which is tau naught. And so what we often say is that the confinement time, particle confinement time in this case, is equal to tau naught, and that's a squared over... Um, n equals 0, so that's just 1, so it's just pi over 2 squared d. And this is equal to then a squared over 2.47 d. Okay. So this is the answer to the question, what is the particle containment time? That was for a slab. Okay, plasma slab, namely Cartesian X, Y, Z geometry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What would happen if I had a cylinder? Um, well, what I turns out, if you go back, uh, then you would have that the divergence of gamma would be equal to uh, minus one over R partial with respect to R R D uh, D N D R. And you would then get uh, a differential equation. Well, you, you would then separate in R and T. And so we would say N is equal to R of R, T of T. And you would get a differential equation, which would be 1 over R, D by DR, R, DR, DR, uh, plus 1 over D tau sub N, capital R is equal to zero. And it turns out this is a Bessel function equation. And so what you would find is that R of R would be just J naught of alpha naught R or alpha sub N R over A 
and Bessel functions J naught of alpha R or of X, let's call it, as a function of X. Bessel functions are kind of like cosines, but they kind of wiggle off and so forth. And it turns out the first zero is 2.404. Uh, the next zero is 5.52. They're irregularly spaced zeros is the moral to the story. Uh, 8.65 and so forth and so on. And so what it turns out is then you find that the confinement time is equal to tau naught is equal to a squared over and instead of getting pi over 2, you get this first zero of the Bessel function, which is often called alpha naught squared d, which is this 2.4048. Okay? And that's approximately equal to a squared over 5.78 times d. And so this is the answer then for a cylinder. And the only thing that's happened that's different from a cylinder to a slab is that the numerical coefficient uh, is different. Um, so that's kind of all I, I, I really want to say about this, uh, except for a few little closing anecdotes, let me put it this way. For heat diffusion, let me just make one anecdote. What you have is you have an equation three halves partial with respect to T, it's heat capacity factor. NT is equal to minus the divergence of Q, and you write the heat flux as minus, some people write it as kappa grad T. I would prefer to write it as minus N chi grad T. And then chi, it turns out, is again a diffusion coefficient, delta X squared over delta T uh, diffusion coefficient. So because of this three halves factor, okay, what you end up with is the tau confinement for a cylinder, uh, this is the more common one, becomes a squared over two-thirds of this first zero of the Bessel function times, in this case, chi as opposed to d. Okay? And two-thirds of about six, everybody knows, is about four. So the very common form that's used is, is about a squared over 4 chi. Okay, the last point I just want to make is uh, any of these confinement times, notice, are of order a squareds over d's. The d's, we said, were of order delta x squared over delta t. So what this says is the confinement time you will get is a multiplier on the random walk processes delta t by the amount of space you have to cover in these small random walk steps. And uh, this multiplier is squared because it's a diffusive process. Okay, so next time we'll talk about a few more specific things about Coulomb collision-induced transport across magnetic field lines uh, and kind of conclude chapter 5 of Chen.